There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. Where was I? Yes. Okay. Global, national, local, etc. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so we find uh, anyway uh, that much of our uh, much of what we consider essential in our technologically advanced culture is a direct result of uh, perpetuating practices of neo neocolonial extractivism and exploitation in the service of capital accumulation. Uh, with uh, Canadian mining companies, in particular here, playing a very large role. Uh, as Kate Crawford notes, uh, the component parts that go into the construction of a single Amazon Echo are intimately tied uh, to a vast complex network of resource extraction and labor exploitation. So the reality behind the production of the devices supposedly integral uh, to our, uh, our modern society uh, is then deliberately mystified uh, behind layers of uh, techno-utopian techno sophistry emanating from Silicon Valley mostly, uh, typified by what uh, Barbara Finn Cameron called a Cal Californian ideology, uh, which is basically the fusion of 60s, uh, uh, the 60s ideal of techno-deterministic emancipation uh, and uh, free market capitalism. They kind of come together in a very strange way. So this paradigm uh, serves to perpetuate uh, the growing chasm between the rich and poor, uh, both, with, both within and among nations. So, we are all uh, more or less familiar with the process of capital flight and subsequent decline in manufacturing in North America, uh, so too with electronics. Uh, David Harvey calls these uh, special, spatial fixes. So these movements, exemplified by the shift in North American uh, big free auto manufacturing, uh, first to Europe, then to South Korea, uh, then Brazil, and so on, uh, uh, so on down the line up to today, um, has worked to resolve, if only temporarily, uh, crises of profit profitability, uh, by relocating production to low-wage regions. To do this successfully uh, requires, uh, as, a, as, a, as our guest here has, has written uh, with, a, with his colleague Dan Green, uh, requires accelerating the infrastructure, uh, 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 quick, faster means of communication, uh, what's called the annihilation of space through time, a compression, essentially, of the globe uh, through accelerated communication networks, uh, for those nations in possession of the latest and fastest means of communication. This in turn perpetuates an imperialist push for uneven development uh, with second and third world nations, uh, succeeded by financial networks focused on regional competition and transnational corporations. Now this is further abetted by a global governance structure uh, set by the ruling classes uh, of wealthy nations, uh, predominantly white and male, uh, that's marked by deregulation, austerity, and an emphasis on finance and trade uh, by their rules uh, alone as a precondition uh, for access to the global economy. And you might hear about this. I think uh, that Dr. Dan is going to be touching on the, the matter of TikTok, Hawaii, Huawei, etc., uh, which is a, a, a contemporary issue that we'll get to learn more about. So the notion of a fix, uh, 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 Green and Joseph uh, uh, mentioned, can be interpreted in, in, in another way as in a powerful drug addiction or a habit. Uh, so as an addict uh, with uh, uh, crack cocaine, what have you, uh, uh, so are capitalists uh, in search uh, of, uh, of greater profit, uh, greater portions of surplus value, uh, just over the horizon, theoretically, uh, in more exploitable regions. So the devices we depend on, these little um, hell machines uh, that, we, that, that, we, uh, that we have in our hands, uh, largely really uh, taken for granted uh, without a thought for how they were produced in the first place or what we may be losing in the process. Uh, this complicity in vast networks of oppression and abstraction is both practically unavoidable at present and not something to sit easily with. So as Homi Baba says, uh, the world shrinks for those who own it. Uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of like down on the chain, but imagine uh, how much the world has shrunk uh, since the introduction of these technologies. Uh, for us, uh, we're able to, to communicate over, over, well, for example, having Dr. Dan here today uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Manchester. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's brought us uh, at least uh, uh, superficially closer together. Uh, and uh, more, anyway, uh, so the world shrinks even more uh, for, for the people that actually have control of these systems uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, for purpose of capital accumulation. Going on. Uh, Anyway, so to help us consider these, th these things, I've uh, called upon our friend and comrade, Dr. Dan Joseph, uh, whom uh, we are very grateful uh, to have with us this morning. Uh, Dr. Dan, originally hailing from uh, the United States, uh, I believe. Yeah. 
uh, was uh, with us in the Communist Party of Canada while he was studying at York University uh, and working in Toronto as a member of the Parkdale Club uh, there. Uh, while his career trajectory has taken him across the pond to uh, uh, Perfidious Albion, I believe, uh, uh, Manchester, uh, Manchester, England, uh, where he's become uh, the senior lecturer uh, in digital sociology of the Department of Sociology at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, Dr. Dan has been kind enough to share with his time, uh, to share his time and expertise with us this morning uh, to give us an overview of uh, the underlying political economy of communication. Uh, he does this for a living. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to him. Uh, so please welcome, uh, as, uh, as far as this digital meeting allows anyway, uh, Dr. Daniel Joseph. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much. Uh, that was that was a really great introduction. You covered a bunch of things that I actually would be more clumsy in saying. So that's that's good. I got some stuff to call back to. Um, yeah. So let me just pull up uh, my slides here, so we all have something to kind of look at while I you hear my droning voice. Um, let's see. So let me get my share screen going here, and we can. Uh, okay, I think this should work. So bring this up and uh, let me see, I can present. So can everyone see that? I'm hoping, uh, I guess it's loading in. Is that seeable? Yep. Yes. yep. All right, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, um, right, so coming to you live from uh, the birthplace of industrial capitalism here. Uh, kind of to, just to talk about um, the kind of main thing that I kind of specialize in in my field. Um, yeah, I did my PhD in communication and cultural studies, and I've kind of become, um, come to, you know, kind of think of myself as a, as a political economist of communication. And so Vinny came to me and said, hey, I want you to kind of talk and, and do a little bit of education about this. So this is like very much like a kind of think of it as like a introduction to a variety of concepts that I think are helpful for us to make sense um, of contemporary issues, uh, make sense of like how we relate to the internet, how we relate to, um, but also like thinking this in terms of like how we relate to the media in general. Uh, so, you know, television and radio and other kinds of things, a lot of the same issues apply. And that's kind of one of the nice things about um, this field of study is that, you know, kind of showing the continuity uh, with past um, uh, issues. So here, uh, like, You've all been reading the news. Um, we all know that like, there's a lot of strange things going on in the world right now. One of them is the kind of ramping up of both the trade war and the kind of new Cold War against China. Um, and this has been going on for a while now. It's not new. You know, you can find this uh, Sydney Mor Morning Herald piece about, you know, how the Five Eyes were kind of coming up with their plan of attack against Huawei's uh, 5G towers and technologies um, a few years ago. We know that the arrest of uh, um, their, uh, their CFO um, it, by the Canadian government was like a big part of this. And a lot of the arguments around this had to do with it's about privacy and security. Um, more recently, we know that Trump has told Microsoft he is 45, they have 45 days to buy TikTok, uh, which is, you know, just a, like a, it's a, it's a, you know, kind of like algorithmically generated, uh, you know, or it uses an algorithm to like forward content to you, um, like, you know, funny videos of music and stuff like that. Um, and it's been kind of framed in the news as, again, this huge security threat because uh, the Chinese government might have access to American citizens' data. Um, and then, of course, more, even more recently, we've heard, you know, there's just now the ban uh, on any financial transactions uh, with WeChat, which is Tencent, um, Tencent's uh, uh, social networking um, platform and stuff like that. So all this is happening, and I figured, well, this is obviously relevant, but I think one thing we need to think about is um, if we're going to talk about all of these things that, you know, this might seem it's like geopolitics, it's the Cold War, things like that are, are happening. Uh, we still need to kind of come back to earth and, and you know, frame how, uh, I guess, like, let me minimize this here. Um, I think we need to kind of understand the basis of uh, like why a lot of these things are happening. It might look like a lot of uh, like pol political issues, but like at the, at the root, again, I think we, you know, we always come back to political economy um, as Marxists. So, and a big thing here is like, I want to stress that we go beyond the text and that's kind of what political economy helps us do. Um, 
And, you know, if we want to understand the content and the consumption of these messages, we need to understand the production and circulation of them. And so, you know, I think the argument that I'm kind of making here is that like a lot of the uh, political issues that are surrounding these stories actually have, a, you know, an economic basis. Um, hold on here. So what is, uh, what am I going to be talking about today? Uh, a little bit of just kind of a quick definition of what the political economy of communication is. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this thing called the audience commodity. Uh, a little bit of a definition of what platform capitalism is, a little bit of definition of like what platforms are, a discussion of platform imperialism, um, and kind of then kind of coming back to like, you know, what like a socialist approach to communications would be. And I think I don't have a lot too much to say there because I don't have too much time, um, but it's kind of like a prompt for any discussion or even just for your own thinking on, on these things, like, you know, thinking about what, what do we want from communications and how should we approach uh, them generally. So this is a book, I really like it. Uh, Vincent Mosca wrote it uh, back, I think, in quite a while ago. There's a number of editions of it now. The second one's really good. And I've been, I come back to this book all the time. So what's it called? The Political Economy of Communication. Um, and Vincent Mosco, uh, he offers two definitions of political economy that I like. So the first is, he calls it the study of the social relations, particularly the power relations that mutually constitute the production, distribution, and consumption of resources, including communication resources. So, you know, here we already at the beginning, we have like, you know, it's power relations, right? And a lot of the root of power is, is often um, economic. Um, and again, looking at production, distribution, and consumption. He says, he also has another uh, definition I think that's also helpful for us. Uh, you know, he says a more general and ambitious definition of political economy is the study of control and survival in social life, right? So who gets to control what and who gets to survive and how do we survive? Um, and so these are kind of like the broad framing uh, that I always go to when I'm studying and, and, and thinking about uh, communications generally. So what do we do? Well, I think we should always start with understanding the media uh, as for-profit businesses or nonprofits, but understanding them as businesses uh, that exist within the capitalist mode of production. And so obviously that shapes a lot of what they're able to do and how they function. Um, if we understand their driving logics uh, towards, you know, profit or, you know, some other, you know, other means like propaganda outfits, things like that, uh, we can then give, have more context for the messages they create. Right, and also the technologies they utilize. Uh, technologies are not neutral, and as we kind of, I'll talk about a little bit about in a second. Um, they're created for a specific reason. Um, so, in this field, uh, I think you know there's kind of three main uh, branches that we can kind of talk about. Uh, first is commodification. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So, how technology and markets turn communication into a commodity. Right, this is at the root of. Uh, the Marxist, you know, of the uh, political economic critique is understanding uh, the, the commodity form itself. So that's really important. Um, other aspects though to pay attention to a lot is spatialization, right? So how capitalism demands that time and space be overcome through communications technologies, right? So Vinny uh, briefly mentioned that um, earlier and that's kind of a key dynamic that I'm always paying attention to. Um, and structuration is kind of like a way of, you know, understanding the structural relations of production in the communications industry. So uh, who owns what, who makes money? And I would add to this also like who gets to make it, who make, who's making choices about it, right? So these are questions around like, you know, classic sociological questions. Um, very quickly, right? So spatialization, uh, space, time and communication. Right, this is all about like the understanding the process of overcoming the constraints of uh, space and time in social life. And as uh, um, Marx said in the Grandrisa, understanding how uh, specifically here annihilates space with time. And so, you know, in 1858, uh, he's already kind of starting to make sense of this. Like, and he, so he says here, the more production comes to rest on exchange value, hence on exchange, the more important do the physical conditions of exchange, the means of communication and transport become for the costs of circulation. Capital by its nature drives beyond every spatial barrier. Thus the creation of the physical conditions of exchange 
of the means of communication and transport, the annihilation of space by time becomes an extraordinary necessity for it. And this is kind of like, I think a key aspect again of what Vinny was talking about, how space and time has completely, uh, like, I mean, radically revolutionarily has changed in the last, you know, 300 years uh, in a ways that, you know, even two generations before people have trouble understanding and recognizing how space and time has changed. And so this is a key aspect that Marx uh, understands in terms of uh, spatialization. Um, if you're looking, uh, if you're asking questions about media industries, you should also be asking questions about class, race, and gender. So, you know, this is where we're kind of like uh, coming to connection with like the field of sociology. So understanding the structural characteristics uh, of these things and how they're, you know, how these like different uh, identities and like categories like play out and affect, uh, you know, um, both like the, the working conditions of these industries, but also how like obviously, um, content is affected, right? So, you know, how are different aspects of communications work uh, gendered or racialized, right? Uh, and, you know, broadly speaking, uh, all, you know, if you just, even if you look at Tom, like the Canadian media ecosystem, for instance, like we know that there's uh, huge disparities, um, both in pay, but also in just like uh, gender and race. Um, right, so, but here in this talk to just kind of like, go into a little bit of depth, uh, let's focus on commodification, because I think this kind of is a key aspect that, you know, we don't talk about enough. Uh, I don't have enough time really to watch this, but if you are curious, uh, as a kind of like artistic uh, augmentation of my talk today, uh, you could watch Richard Serra's Television Delivers People. Um, it's an interesting uh, artistic and political critique of the television industry. It's from 1973. Um, it's, it's very, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, briefly, it's basically kind of like a discussing, um, what I'm talking about right now with a little bit of a elevator music. It's, it's, it's very entertaining. Um, but basically what we have here is like a kind of, you know, seven minute long discussion of what the audience commodity is. So how do we uh, create um, com commodities out of communication, right? So, and this is the focus here, transforming messages ranging from bits of data to systems of meaningful thought into marketable products, right? And I think on the face of it, it's not necessarily immediately obvious how you do this. Um, and a key contribution to understanding how this takes place uh, was kind of like written up in 1977 by Dallas Smythe. He wrote an article about it called uh, Communications, Blind Spot of Western Marxism. Uh, and he later put that into a, a book called uh, Dependency Road, Communications, Capitalism, Consciousness, and Canada. Uh, and it has a chapter called On the Audience Commodity and Its Work. Um, both are really excellent. Uh, this is kind of where a lot of the ideas that even if they've been debated and, and augmented and changed in the intervening years, still forms a lot of the basis of how we understand what the audience commodity is. So what does he say in it? Um, in 1977, he thought, broadly speaking, Marxists and other political and other communications theorists generally were focusing too much on ideology, uh, focusing on the political content of messages, you know, and arguing about whether or not these were effective. You know, do they control people? Uh, this goes back to some, you know, media effects research around like the idea of the hypodermic model, uh, hypodermic needle model, things like that. Um, and but his argument was that, you know, the focus of analysis for materialists should be on the economic function the mass media serve. Right? We live in capitalism. Uh, capitalists that own communications industries and media companies and stuff like that, they want to make money. So we need to understand how and why. Um, and he also said that there was a lot of, uh, there was a lack of research on advertising, on market research, public relations, product and package design, something I would actually like to see more of. Uh, I haven't actually seen a lot of product and package design research. Very interesting though. Um, yeah, and, he, and basically kind of like for him, he's doubling down on the Marxist critique of saying like, if we focus too much on the ideas of, of the media, we're going to miss... Uh, the forest for the trees in a sense we're going to miss like the structural conditions in which mess messages are being created we're going to focus only on ideas and he says this is idealist um so he says uh in this article uh, the bourgeois idealistic uh idealist view of the reality of the communicate of the communication commodity 
is messages, information, images, meaning, entertainment, orientation, education, and manipulation. All of these concepts are subjective mental entities and all deal with superficial appearances. What does he say? So I submit that the materialist answer to the question, what is the commodity form of mass produced advertiser supported communications under monopoly capitalism is audiences and readerships hereafter referred to for simplicity as audiences. Right. Um, and this is, this is a big change and, and kind of an important shift in how we understand communications. Cause like, Broadly speaking, um, there wasn't too much writing until after World War II. Um, and in the 19th and 20th century, not, there wasn't much writing on the, you know, on the media industries at all or anything really about the culture industries uh, in a particularly systematic way. Um, so, you know, he, you know, we obviously, if, you, you know, if you're a Marxist, you've probably come across uh, his discussion of ideology and the production of it and the German ideology. Um, but he doesn't describe the industry in depth. Uh, and the thing was, is that, you know, up to this point, uh, most media was, you know, funded by, it was, it was reader funded in a sense, like directly, it was very easy to understand how it was created uh, and it wasn't necessarily profitable. So, you know, it's like, it's funded by church sex. Uh, it's funded by subscriptions. It's funded by political parties, things like that. Like the ideological orientation and the production of these things was very kind of um, obvious in a sense. Uh, but this changes in the late 19th century and modern mass media come into being and there's a heavy emphasis on advertising revenue, specifically in newspapers, but uh, this becomes, you know, a driving force in radio and television. Uh, so, you know, by the 60s and 70s, we have a massive uh, telecommunications uh, and media industry, um, you know, all this kind of thing. And, and specifically in distinct in North America, because in European both, you know, in the Eastern Bloc, but also in, uh, you know, kind of uh, the capitalist West uh, Germany, um, they had very different uh, rules and regulations around ownership of telecommunications. Um, and advertising didn't dominate in the same way as it, did, as it had come to in North America. Um, but what he says here, and this is he's like, he kind of describes it as a canary in the coal mine. He thinks like the American model is going to be generalized across the planet. And he has uh, been very much proven right in this sense. So he starts asking a number of questions. So uh, what does an advertiser buy when they buy ads? Um, you know, he says like, has, as hard-nosed businessmen, they are not paying for advertising for nothing nor for altruism. And so his argument is that he, they are buying the services of audiences with predictable specifications, who will pay attention in predictable numbers and at predictable times to particular means of communication, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, billboards, and third-class mail. Um, and then he asks the question, how do they make sure they get what they pay for? And this is where rating agencies come in, right? So analytics companies, things like that, that specialize in the kind of work to ensure the accuracy and predictability of demographics. Um, AC Nielsen is obviously, is famously uh, one of the most important. There are many more now in the digital world. Um, and they use surveys and other forms of measurement to try to do this. Uh, the funny thing is though, is that quite often um, this research was flat out incorrect and wrong, but it kind of didn't matter in a lot of ways because there was only a few companies that did uh, this kind of work. Um, Eileen Meehan's actually written quite a, uh, excellently about this and specifically she's written about um, the construction of gender uh, as like a new kind of market um, around this time in the 1970s and 80s. Ah, going as fast as I can, okay. So, and who produces uh, this commodity, which advertisers are buying? Um, and he says, well, so it's the owners of TV and radio stations, magazines. Basically, if you own the means of communicative production, you get to sell this particular commodity. Um, and they also, you know, we can obviously talk about this in the sense of uh, Facebook and Google. We'll do that in a little bit. Um, and keys, yeah, they, they produce the content and or they own the infrastructure that delivers this commodity. So uh, obviously advertiser supported media is almost always free, not always, but most of the time. Um, so what is the nature of the content? And Smythe talks about this as a bribe. He calls it the free lunch, uh, like kind of harkening back to the you know, late 19th and early 20th century uh, saloon free lunch that you'd get as long as you bought some beer. I wish this was, was still the case. I never get a free lunch when I buy a beer at the pub. Um, 
But you know, the idea is that like the assumption is that the customers spend more on the drinks to make back the loss, right? And so this is kind of his example. So he says the free lunch consists of materials which whet the prospective audience members' appetites and thus attract and keep them attending to the program, newspaper, or magazine, and cultivate a mood conducive to favorable reaction to the explicit and implicit advertisers' messages. This is not to discount, however, the idea that the messages don't matter at all, but just that there's certain questions we should be asking of the production of the content and the reason it's being made for a profit. But we should still understand the, as he calls it, the agenda setting function of the editorial content of media and advertising, right? So we still do need to care about its ideological function. Um, and the key thing also is the work of the people who work at these companies is actually, you know, generally speaking, pretty technically uh, complex. And so they need to hire a pretty, you know, sophisticated and skilled workforce to uh, do that. Um, and, you know, if we understand uh, capitalism as a system that constantly needs to reproduce itself, it is not uh, far off base to, you know, make a pretty accurate assumption that the content, broadly speaking, will be oriented towards uh, reproducing that system, right, in whatever form that might be. So what do the audiences actually do, though, that are being sold? Well, so Smythe says, the work which audience members perform for the advertisers to whom they have been sold is to learn to buy particular brands of consumer goods and to spend their income accordingly. Right, and so this is, uh, I was actually just reading uh, Capital today. There's, you know, the chapter on a simple reproduction, I think chapter 21. Um, but basically the idea that like, if this is a self-fulfilling and self-reproducing system, it is totalizing in the sense of, at the level of, of classes themselves, a class needs to reproduce itself, right? Um, and capitalists need to valorize their capital. So, you know, you need audiences to demand the kind of things you're producing. Um, and as a result of this, a happy accident is that the workers continue to live because most of the products that are sold on television have something to do with uh, social reproduction. Not always, but quite a few. So, you know, kind of, uh, summing up here is just the idea that audiences, those of us who in interact uh, with uh, free media, um, were actually sold uh, by media companies to buyers of audiences whose self-interest is ensuring that audiences will buy their goods on the market. Um, he's that this still happens today, uh, but it's augmented and intensified by digital platforms, right? So not only do we have uh, free television and radio and uh, different kinds of uh, but we also have social media platforms that we use for free. So and this is kind of where it's important to bring in the concept of platform capitalism. Uh, you know, so some of the definitions here I'll be talking about uh, come from a Nick Cernick's book, uh, Platform Capitalism. A lot of the books I'm talking about here uh, just are very literal, political economy and communication, platform capitalism. The, the other book is called Platform Imperialism. Anyway. Very easy titles. So uh, think of companies like Facebook, Google, Salesforce, Uber, uh, stuff like that. These are companies that are made possible by the internet, um, but they do not necessarily make the sale of the audience commodity as its only business model. It's one amongst many. Um, and uh, Cernick's uh, argument in this book is that like we can learn a lot about major tech companies by taking them to be economic actors within a capitalist mode of production. Again, um, so quickly, what is a platform? He defines it as uh, digital infrastructures that allow two or more people to interact. They therefore position themselves as intermediaries that bring together different users, customers, advertisers, producers, suppliers, and even physical objects. Um, in kind of like mainstream business studies and economic thinking, they often describe these as uh, multi-sided markets, two-sided markets. Right, a platform is a thing that brings people together. Um, and key thing about all this is that this means there's a tendency towards concentration. So the internet as it was constructed is, you know, it's kind of quote, open and decentralized. Um, and it wasn't necessarily clear for a long time how money was going to get made on a decentralized internet. Uh, but a lot of social media platforms that have become large and, well, and quite profitable, what they have done is by kind of like taking the model pioneered by video game companies uh, in the 1980s of creating closed environments that they can kind of exact and, and exert more control over. 
And the, the argument is that uh, they basically become the market rather than competing in markets. So these things are built to take advantage of networks of network effects, uh, which is the, the, you know, the kind of like classic argument that like the value of the network increases as more people use it. A social media network with only one person on it isn't very social. A social media network with only two people on it isn't very social either. Uh, but, you know, broadly speaking, I hate Facebook, but I stay on Facebook because there's enough people on it to make it worthwhile for me as a m mode of communication. So Cernick's argument is that platform capitalism has four tendencies. Uh, the first one is the expansion of extraction. So the intensification of data mining, which is productively sold to advertisers and marketing companies for a profit. So if you saw any writing about uh, the Shoshana Zuboff book called Surveillance Capitalism, that's kind of her main argument, you know, all about like data mining is the kind of like new uh, commodity um, that's shaping the whole system. Um, another tendency uh, that Cernick talks about is a company positioning itself as a gatekeeper. So gaining control over vital exchange points for capital and labor. You can see this in terms of like financial platforms, um, being becoming a gatekeeper like Uber or Airbnb, things like that. Basically, like, you know, if, if Uber is a platform that mediates uh, people who need to get somewhere and people who have a car and are willing to drive you, uh, Uber takes a lot of money by mediating that transaction, right? Um, another uh, tendency is a convergence of markets. So we see companies that are in previously different markets find themselves in competition. Um, and finally, uh, the enclosure of ecosystems. So putting users in a walled, fully controlled garden. So again, like the idea of if you have Apple products, specifically an iPhone or something like that, you can only get approved uh, apps that have been that have come through the uh, the iTunes, um, the Apple App Store, basically. Uh, so we've got platform capitalism and now I think it's if we want to continue to understand though what's going on is we also need to have a theory of platform imperialism. Uh, so here is I mean you know some of you might know this some of you might not but like I, I've always found it very interesting about how in the early days of the internet it was framed very explicitly as a free trade zone. So here's uh, Bill Clinton making that argument. Thank you very much. that for the first time, all the children without regard to their personal circumstances. In many ways, electronic commerce is like the Wild West of the global economy. Our task is to make sure that it's safe and stable terrain for those who wish to trade on it. And we must do so by working with other nations now, while electronic commerce is still in its infancy. To meet this challenge, I'm pleased to announce the release of our new framework for global electronic commerce. A report that lays out principles we will advocate as we seek to establish basic rules for international electronic commerce. I'm directing Commerce Secretary Daly and to coordinate our outreach to the private sector. Because the internet has such explosive potential for prosperity, it should be a global free trade zone. It should be a place where government makes every effort first, as the Vice President said, not to stand in the way, to do no harm. We want to encourage the private sector to regulate itself as much as possible. We want to encourage all nations to refrain from imposing discriminatory taxes, tariffs, unnecessary regulations, cumbersome bureaucracies on electronic commerce. We'll be able to extend our trade. Right, so I think it's really important to remember that when the internet went wide, when it became the World Wide Web, it was framed very much by the United States as by the place where the internet was like kind of spread from as a free trade zone. Again, if we think about, you know, kind of a, maybe if there's, there's nothing more holy uh, to capitalism than free trade and kind of understanding this uh, origin point, I think is really, really important. So we need to understand platform capitalism within the structural dynamics of imperialism. Uh, here's, you know, I'm kind of like, working uh, with uh, Lenin's uh, theory of imperialism, you know, it's like the unequal exchange of val wealth, value, and capital between core and periphery, the colonized and the decolonized. Um, so we've long uh, recognized in my field uh, in communication and cultural studies of cultural imperialism, like US dominance in film and television and radio and other kinds of forms of media programming. Um, but uh, like, what about the internet and its transnational character? You know, has this changed or reduced the importance of the state that you create content within? What role does the state play in the internet? Has, did 
the state get out of the way uh, that the United States, as Bill Clinton seemed to be arguing, did it, you know, just let everyone regulate themselves and not do anything else? Um, no. Uh, and, and I think we need to understand that, like, much of the technologies that we understand uh, as central to the internet, and both, like, in terms of hardware and software, they come out of uh, the United States uh, military um, industrial complex. And so, you know, if you just look here, uh, almost everything about the, you know, the most popular smartphone in the world uh, actually comes from state and government spending. Um, and, it, you know, basically everything has like been touched by DARPA, the Department of uh, Education, the National Science Foundation, the Navy. Uh, right. So the iPhone is actually a product of state spending, of specifically United States uh, military spending. Um, and again, to kind of return to the, the concept of network effects, they give advantage to established players with large user bases. There were all kinds of networks around the world before the introduction of the internet and the World Wide Web in the 1990s. The thing was is that uh, ARPANET uh, and NSFNET became the basis of the World Wide Web. So the United States had first mover advantage in this sense, right? Um, TCP IP and packet switching, these became the standards for ARPANET and they spread out from it. Right, uh, and US-based technology companies and later platforms have dominated uh, because of this kind of like first mover advantage that they had. Um, it doesn't mean, I mean, and, and I think it's also important to think that like while hardware has as a result in a lot of ways like kind of dwindled um, and it's an importance and software became like the dominant uh, like defining um, uh, element of you know like the kind of like post-industrial capitalism that, that was kind of ushered in after the 1970s and 1980s and a key thing because of the dominance of the US in these early networks a uh, very few countries even competitors and junior partners in the imperialist alliance uh, with the United States have been able to challenge US dominance um, you know very few countries have successful platforms all right um, you know, they have, uh, a lot of them have large telecommunications and infrastructure companies that are owned by, uh, like, nationally. So, you know, we can look at, uh, um, in Canada, you know, there's a handful of large privately owned uh, telecommunications and communications companies. But the platforms that we use on them and the content that moves through uh, these networks remains mostly American in scope. Um, and I actually have a paper about this, uh, if anyone's intrigued by this, kind of like looking at cultural production and the way uh, like imperialist dynamics shape um, this, the creation of apps, like who gets to make apps uh, around the world. Um, the answer is basically the United States, uh, some parts of Europe and Canada um, and Japan, but the majority of those apps that are actually made outside the United States are still owned by the United States, by corporations based in the United States. So value uh, capture still flows back to the imperialist core. Um, and we should also understand the context of, you know, network, like of uh, platforms and things like that within inter-imperialist rivalries. Uh, you know, US dominance in these communications industries is not in the interest of the capitalists outside the US. Um, and, you know, even if they fancy themselves very transnational, there's still, uh, interests on the part of the state and of capitalists to kind of like make inroads on the US. And so we've seen that to a large extent uh, in the EU um, in the last 10 years. And you know, if you've ever uh, had to click on a GDPR notification, um, that's because the EU has begun to regulate and, and actually turn the internet away from being that kind of quote unquote, that free trade zone that Bill Clinton was talking about, right? Um, the EU is trying to gain more control over how the internet is used uh, inside Europe. Um, and, but we also have, and again, kind of going back to the start of this conversation, uh, the rise of China's tech industries, um, which is unique. Uh, so here, you know, like their development of their nationally bounded communications and technology companies is, is very distinct from almost every other country on the planet. Um, and it was basically based on premise on technological sovereignty and maintaining national control, not just over infrastructure, but also software and services. Um, and they, as a result, were able to le leverage network effects internally to their advantage, right? China's population was quite large, and that meant that they had a market uh, and, and users ready to take on these platforms and use them 
and, make, and create an install base. Um, these companies, you know, they still compete on imperialist terms, uh, like externally, um, they have, you know, the U S sets the standard and China does have to compete with them if they want to, you know, just make money. Um, so, you know, they extend uh, many of the same logics as our platform selling, uh, ads, like, you know, engaging in like, uh, you know, like ride shares and things like that. They, you know, it's, this is, it's not particularly super different. Um, and there is a lot of competition in China between these platforms. And I think actually they developed them much quicker. Uh, I mean, or they developed them much faster. I don't know, I'm always learning from my students uh, new things about what's happening in China with their platforms and stuff. And they're, it's very, it's, I almost think, well, that's the future in a way that uh, here in Canada, well, in Canada or here even in Europe, it's not quite as advanced. Um, but the key difference with all of this is if they still have to engage in platform capitalism to a certain extent is that they are in the last interest subject to the laws of the PRC, which every other country probably actually wishes that they had more sovereignty over their telecommunications and platforms. Um, you know, they like were able to compete because of their, you know, their large market and you can kind of see the alternative uh, to the, what happened in China, which is India's uh, development of their internet. And, and, you know, they don't have anything even slightly on a scale um, with what China has been able to develop. And as a result, like Facebook and other Western owned uh, platforms continue to dominate in pre pretty much every other place other than China. Um, China's uh, market penetration outside of East Asia is pretty negligible. Uh, most of the users of the platforms, you know, WeChat and, and uh, in the West um, are the Chinese diaspora, right? Um, so, and Daoyong Jin, who uh, wrote this book, again, uh, where, where I have it, here it is, Digital Platforms, Imperialism and Political Culture. Much of this is ripped from his book. He says, importantly, at the, uh, he says, a critical interrogation of the global hegemony of platforms proves the dominant position of the U.S. and that it has intensified an increasingly unequal relationship between the West and the East at an alarming rate. In the 21st century, the world has become further divided into a handful of Western states which have developed platforms and a vast majority of non-Western states which do not have advanced platforms. Uh, and he kind of like groups the United States, Japan, South Korea, uh, and a few other countries as the kind of like core countries that were able to develop extensive platforms that were able to go beyond their borders. Um, so that's just like one way of kind of like trying to understand both the domination of the United States, but also the kind of challenge that uh, China's rise in their tech industries uh, poses um, and, and giving also a sense of like understanding why there is this current political uh, turmoil and why Donald Trump would actually want to begin to regulate China. Well, the, the, the answer is, is, you know, this is about power and hegemony. Um, and I think the discussions around privacy, uh, you know, we can talk about this more later, but I think the discussions around privacy are almost always like basically immaterial. It's about, it's about power, it's about money. Um, right, so a socialist approach to the internet. Here's some prompts and stuff that, uh, you know, I've, I've written a number of things where I'm trying to think these, through these problems. Uh, I wrote an article um, for Motherboard a few years ago about um, Canada's creating its own uh, networking um, in the 1970s, or at least when the Science Council proposed a different path as far as uh, computer networking was concerned. Um, I wrote a piece uh, in the Spark a few years ago called What Should Socialists Do About the Internet? I kind of talk about some of these issues. Um, and recently, uh, for Briar Patch, I wrote a piece called Platforms for People, Not Profit, that kind of uh, discusses and, and kind of poses some of the questions that I've posed here today, but also kind of floating some possible solutions um, to, you know, to what, how do we create a more democratic uh, form of communication using what we have uh, with the internet. Uh, a key thing I think to remember is that we need to understand why the media and platform companies, if we are to understand why they do what they do, it's because they're capitalist industries. Um, we can't, you know, their pursuit is profit and power. Um, and key is that the internet is not a neutral technology. Uh, it's a surveillance tool for states and private corporations. Um, at the same time, it affords a struggle for socialism a new, though limited platform. As we know, we, we've benefited a lot from certain forms of social media to you know, get our messages out there in a way that we never were able to before, we're able to communicate uh, like this. Um, and, you know, 
I think we can always, we need to be thinking about uh, reforms, um, you know, barring uh, the revolution, we, we should be considering reforms that are worth considering, uh, worth pushing for. So maybe that's some forms of nationalization, obviously not all kinds, because again, we know there's limits to that, definitely. Um, we could be thinking about anti-monopoly legislation. That's a thing that's been going on in the United States uh, with their, the Senate hearings, I think. They've called in Zuckerberg and, and Google and other companies to talk about you know, concentration of those industries. In the EU, there's definitely anti-monopoly legislation will probably come into force not uh, in the next few years. Um, we need to be thinking about community run or municipal networks, like kind of uh, networks that you know, community and, and, and can actually control themselves. Um, for thinking about cultural production, we need to maybe think about, you know, actual state funding for cultural production if we're going to fight against um, imperialist, you know, cultural imperialism, specifically in the way it does shape what gets made, both, uh, you know, in the United States, but elsewhere. Um, thinking about electronic commerce regulation, like, uh, should we be taxing things more on, on the internet, right? Um, should we be thinking about how certain forms of commodities move through it? Uh, obviously, privacy regulations uh, are key. You know, data should be secure. Like, we shouldn't be selling. Uh, it shouldn't be this easy commodity to just go out and buy. And it is very easy to buy uh, if you have money. Um, we should be thinking about anti-spying laws, obviously. Um, you know, regulations against digital hate speech, definitely a problem still. It's not going away. Uh, that will happen. There was probably a good chance that more and more, like, pressure will get put on to think about how we understand free speech on the internet. And then just kind of general questions around like what digital democracy looks like. We shouldn't fetishize uh, computers and technology when it comes to democracy, but we should also be careful uh, how we think about it. Um, right, and we need uh, to have some hard considerations about, uh, you know, like what the internet is. And we do know that the state can and will use it to spy on us. That's just, that's guaranteed. Um, We've known about that before uh, the Snowden leaks. We definitely know that it continues today. Uh, we know they'll continue to use it to spread lies. We know that they'll continue to use it to spread propaganda. Um, and again, all those reforms that I just talked about, they're still very limited in scope, right? They're not, that's not socialism. Those are things that might help us gain a little bit of power, but they're not gonna fix the problem that's at the core of, the, of, of platform capitalism and platform imperialism. The, like, commodities are like communication will continue to be turned into a commodity, right? Like that's not going to not happen unless we change uh, the whole mode of production. Um, and we also know that even with state power, like even if like, a, you know, there's some kind of like social democratic coalition gets elected in any kind of country and if they want to gain more control and, and um, sovereignty over uh, electronic communications, like on the internet and otherwise, there's a serious limit uh, to what's going to happen with that. Um, and we can see that push back against China, which very much has played on, you know, very on much the terms of the West because, you know, it's been forced on them. Um, they, you know, the United States still doesn't want to play ball with them, right? Like, because it's a threat to their power and hegemony. So we need to understand outside of that, uh, especially countries that don't have large populations, places that, you know, gaining control over their sovereignty is going to be much harder. Um, and so we need to think about that in terms of like our sense of like our internationalism, but also just any possible uh, limits to, you know, um, like what socialism looks like, uh, barring, you know, serious uh, changes to the global political economy. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I got. Uh, I hope that wasn't too long. Um, but yeah, that, that's me. Is that... Uh, yeah. So that's, 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 yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, with that uh, done, I'd like to open it up uh, to, uh, to our audience here to see if uh, there's any, uh, any questions for Dr. Dan about what he just presented, uh, any uh, thoughts or ideas, if you want to uh, uh, either uh, I don't know, put your hand up or type it out into, uh, into the chat room. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, maybe get a discussion going. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me.
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because this is where, I, like, a lot of it comes up against my, like, I'm not a, all my research is, like, on, like, all the bad things the companies do. And, like, I don't research all the cool projects that are, um, people are attempting and have attempted around this kind of thing. Um, but I think, yeah, like, it would be, it would not just be, like, obviously creating, you know, making sure that everyone has access to high-speed internet is, is key. Um, but that's only the start, right? And I think, for me, the question is just, like, how like like having control over platforms right like having control like giving communities control over how they communicate with each other so that means like you know um maybe it's like a like a mastodon instance or something like that if you know if mastodon's kind of like open source uh twitter replacement you can have really small communities or really large ones um maybe it's like you know a community run uh like um uh, instant messaging kind of service like a discord or a, or a slack or something like that that is regulated and the rules are are set down by those communities um like but yeah and where they also like have access to the back end they can change things for themselves right rather than being forced to use corporate platforms that don't have any interest in in like giving you access to how they work they've monetized it in their own interests and not into the community's interests and stuff like that so I think the question for me is always just like a municipal thing should be not just connectivity, but it should be actual community control. And that means it'll be messy. It won't necessarily be a fun place to be, but it like, you know, democracy is, is, is a messy thing. Right. Um, I think, but the key would just be that it's, it's the people themselves that have the ability to shape what those platforms look like. I think what we're seeing is, and this is like, I could, you know, I, I could be wrong. I haven't been following them as much as I should, but my guess is that the U S states panic around the monopolization and the centralization of these industries more comes down to whether or not they're a threat to this, to U S state. Um, and so like, I think the panic around like the Russia gate panic, you know, the idea that like, Oh, the Russians used our platforms to manipulate our elections. Um, which, you know, total horseshit, but like the, the argument that the idea that like it was an effective operation, I mean, that's the horseshit part, not whether or not Russia, you know, spent money on bots or tried to get some people to influence anyone. But the argument that it was actually effective means that there's like political, I think, concern that these platforms aren't as subservient to the U.S. state as they should be. And so they want, I think what we're going to see is like whether or not the U.S. state will get to exert more authority because I don't think they'll break up these organizations, these companies, unless they refuse to play ball with the U.S. state. I think, and I think at every opportunity they will play ball because it's not really, you know, they can talk a big talk about you know privacy or whatever, but I don't think it's really. I think they'll be happy to sell out their users um, to stay big. So, yeah, I think that's the question. Is like it's the legitimacy of whether or not they're like sufficiently American you know, sufficiently in like subordinate to the U.S. state um, in a way that, uh, you know, gives them, um, yeah, that kind of like questions of their authority. That's a really good question. And it's one I'm always kind of oscillating on. So the other thing, like if you actually read uh, the chapter um, that Smythe writes, like he basically says that all, all life now is kind of subordinated to the wage relationship. So even when you're not working, you're working. So his argument is that like the audience commodity is literally value creating labor, um, which I think is obviously the most spicy uh thing that you know depending on your position in, in marxist economics you'll either hate or or find really interesting and um i think you can make a case for the audience commodity as something that's packaged and created without necessarily going to that position but i do think i think the thing about data creation is that it does require to a certain extent broadly it requires the the fiction even if it's not true that it's real people making the data right and so if it has to be a real person 
that means there's something unique about the activities that that human being is engaging in to create the data exhaust that is then sold to at you know two different companies as a commodity uh you know you as an audience as a, as a creator of that information um it does seem to suggest that there's something unique about the human quality in it and so i think it's not beyond the pill to imagine that there's a lot of unpaid labor happening and it is value creating labor because it's still being sold uh, for, you know, it's, it's being valorized on a market. Um, I, yeah, I, I kind of, I think it depends on the day of the week, uh, whether or not I'm, I'm fully on board with it, but I think it's interesting, but I think the, the argument, what's funny is that the argument around data sovereignty and protecting privacy, is like as a kind of like unique commodity what's happening is that a lot of like liberal uh, uh like lawyers and stuff like that like in the united states kind of created them this movement i forget what it's called i think shoshana zuboff is kind of like the most popular expression of this in in her book surveillance capitalism is that like there should be the kind of like a bill of rights for for users of these things and data portability you should own your own data you create it it makes them money so you own it so it's almost like she's saying like we should have like labor power in the same way that you can go into a marketplace and sell labor power to to a capitalist and you agree to give them a certain amount of hours of your life you should be able to go on the marketplace of data production and sign a contract with a platform um and and give them your data so in a sense we're seeing the commodification of that side of of the production of um so you know we're almost seeing like a like the kind of a creation of wage labor this is like data labor of some kind um so it's interesting uh but the liberal argument is that we should we should do that i, I don't think it's really like from the perspective of you know if, if, if you're a communist i don't really think we need to be particularly concerned with uh like the individual rights of it i'm not saying it's bad but i think it's it's not going to solve the problem like you know zuboff's whole thing is just like oh all we need to do is make sure we give people rights and that's good enough. But we know that the right to sell my labor on the labor market is like a false right, right? Like my choice is to starve or, or sell, you know? Um, telling people that they own their own data and their choices socialize or not, you know, use these services or not. I don't think that's much of a choice. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, I think, but I think politically, I don't think, I don't know how much we have to gain by saying like, we're all users and gosh darn it, like we deserve our rights too. I don't know if it's, if it's compelling, like enough to, yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, no, that's, that's my thoughts, I'm rambling. <laughs> hey, thank you. I'm wondering if Dan has a, a, a and if there's other questions, please, please keep them coming, but I'm wondering if Dan has read um, uh, uh, Socialism, I think it's uh, Socialism, A Life Cycle by Regis Debray. Uh, did even uh, need that for you? Anyway, it goes on to say uh, a couple of things about uh, about uh, the successful diffusion of socialist ideas uh, being kind of dependent on the written word at the at the, the very beginning. Which uh, uh, I'd be interested to get your, your your thoughts on this. I mean, if you think like the change to uh, to digital media to uh, well, first before digital was the video uh, 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 video auditory uh, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Uh, but the, the shifting thing is that uh, it does not uh, uh, translate to maybe uh, uh, sitting down and thinking through uh, uh, things like political, political, political economy, for instance. For instance, I mean, Marx wrote Capital uh, for for workers to read, and uh, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, <laughs> very difficult. Uh, so, uh, so this is a this is a you know uh, these days anyway. But uh, so yeah, I, I'm wondering if you if you. Uh, uh, you're not familiar with that, but uh, that's okay. But uh, you know, if you have any ideas about uh, how you can best use digital platforms today to diffuse it, you mentioned a little bit of just how things have changed a little bit. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think it's a matter of of like you know, I, the way I think about technologies, and I think of you know, books are as much of a technology as the internet. Um, like they have they have affordances and they have constraints, right? Um, books are good at presenting ideas in certain ways but a constant thing that you know i've been reading uh, capital um lockdown happened and i got really bored so i told all i got all my new friends here in manchester and i was like who wants to read it with me so we're pretty far through now just because we had lots of time um and 
one thing I keep coming back to is like when we're reading it, we're always kind of saying like, wouldn't it be really interesting if there was like some great illustrations or, you know, really like visual moving components to kind of illustrate some of the arguments getting made? Because it's a very logical book, but it's not necessarily immediately obvious how to like show this because the book's all about dialectics and movement, right? Like it's all about showing the movement of things. Um, and so like, I think, you know, books have, you know, again, they have affordances and, and, and constraints. Um, and I think with digital media and stuff like that, like we can use it. Uh, we should be looking to the things that they're really good at and looking to the things that they're, they have serious limitations with. Um, and, you know, use them best. Like we shouldn't try to jam, for instance, all, you know, political discourse on the Twitter because it's, it's really good for some things. It's really good for sharing information. It's not really good for conversations. Facebook, same way, right? Like there's some things Facebook can be pretty good with. Uh, there's a lot of things that's really bad with, like just how information is presented through comment systems and likes and all these things. You know, like you can create technology that really encourages us to engage in antisocial behavior. Um, and even if it's not what we necessarily go to it for. And so, you know, video is really good, but video has its limitations too, right? Like, and I'm about to start teaching in the fall and I'm still trying to figure out how the heck I'm going to be doing teaching, uh, you know, like this, like I'm going to be off doing my slides every week. I'm going to have to get people, I'm going to have to try and find a way to do a seminar. You know, like how do you do a club, like a meeting, like, and I'm sure all of you have dealt with this, like how, like running club meetings and stuff like that is very different in over the internet than it is in a room. And so we have to be thinking about what does it afford us? Like what's, what's the media technology good with and what are its serious limitations and not try to jam them all together. Um, yeah. So that's like my kind of like, big idea thing i don't know I, I like videos i love videos like i love i love podcasts like i play video games you know i watch movies like they all have different place it's just finding figuring out like the right place to put it um you know for what you want to do you have to ask your question what am i trying to do and then you can maybe find a technology that helps yeah Uh, yeah, I, as far as the question of rent is concerned, I've definitely uh, thought a lot about that. Um, I think, yeah, like Smythe's argument, I wouldn't be particularly, the whole like, is it a consumer side thing? I think that's, it's, it's an interesting question theoretically. I, I think there is a lot of rent happening and I think it's a kind of thing um, in, in social reproduction is this that like there's a lot, the, the surplus is shared by many people, right? And these companies definitely take their share of the surplus. Uh, by controlling uh, exchange points, right? And this is again, if, yeah, and you know, familiar with economics, like they've written a lot about uh, like the, like basically like what it means to be a, a multi-sided market um, and how being a market gives you special uh, rent seeking um, options. So yeah, no, I like definitely, I think that's interesting and I, and I don't um, disagree that a lot of that is happening. So um, yeah. I think, and that is why I talked about as far as like, uh, you know, um, the monopoly side of things. And then as far as, um, what's it called? Uh, kind of losing my train of thought here, but the, the around privacy and rights online. No, I, I, I completely agree that we do need to defend them. I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's any question there, especially around surveillance and privacy. I think, I think it's just, again, that there, we need to understand them as I think kind of like, I think it's again. It's just, it's there. There are reforms, and um, and I think there's there's limits to them. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't. I think defend them and take them very seriously. I think it's just a matter of like, you know, understanding that limit, which I think is kind of a specialization of uh, of people like us. So I think we, you know, you go in with a sober mindset, and I think we can understand um, the limits of the things that we do uh, advocate for that are merely uh, transitional. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. And if there's anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll think about it later. But um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I think it's. I think they're really good. I think podcasts um, are very effective, actually. As far as like, I don't know. So the thing they're good at is is getting you to really kind of like let 
information come into you and you're not looking at something, you're kind of probably doing something else or driving a car, you're walking somewhere, you're on public transit. So you do get to fill a lot of parts of your time that you, I think a lot of people, you can't really necessarily be reading during those times, but you can be listening. So I think in that sense, it's like a, it's a medium that lets, that can come to you in a lot of different places. Um, so that's the really cool thing. You get to use a lot of time and we don't have a lot of time uh, to, you know, I think these days, like we're quite busy with work and, and life and everything else. And it's hard to find time to just sit down and read. Um, so I think podcasts are a way of getting that information to people in, in a way that like they actually have time for. So I like that part of it. Um, the interesting thing I think about it is like in the same way that radio, it's a very intimate medium, you know, like you can kind of like, you almost get the sense of like the people in your ear, your friends, like there's some podcasts I've been listening to for years. Um, and like, I remember like thinking time, like one of them would be leaving. I'm like, I'm really sad. Why? It's cause I feel like I'm losing a family member or something like that. They're disappearing to another country. Um, you know, because like there is something like, it's like this parasocial relationship. It's like a very intense feeling I think you can get from audio. Um, so there's limit, like it also, it's a really like, it can kind of create like, uh, trying to think like you can kind of almost get a sense of like you're closer with the people than you really are, which can kind of be dangerous sometimes. Um, no, but I, I think, I think podcasts are great. Like I, but I mostly listen to, I listen to ones about video games. I, that's my, that's my me time. That's my fun time when I'm listening to podcasts. That's like, I think too much about politics the rest of my day. So I, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. For sure. And, and I know there, there's a people who have been radicalized by podcasts. That's a thing. A lot of people have had their politics change because they love listening to that stuff. So yeah, anyway. It's definitely not my area of specialty. So I can't speak with authority on what other academics are talking about with it. Um, but it, there is quite a lot of thinking about it. But the one thing I do like, again, kind of looking at uh, the political economy of media industries when I can is just that we know that um, like advertising revenue has, it went from one of the most profitable uh, forms of, um, of, of, you know, like 40% profits uh, at a lot of newspaper companies, you know, 30, 40 years ago. That was just like, it was guaranteed print money machine. Um, that's all changed because of Facebook and Google and other like ad delivery companies and stuff like that. Um, so that's why newspapers are in a crisis because they can't actually afford their operations anymore at the scale that they used to run. Um, I think, yeah, we're going to see more of what we have in Canada, which is like government bailouts basically for them justified because it's the, you know, it's journalism. They're supposed to, that's like, we need that for a healthy public sphere yada, yada, yada. So that becomes the kind of like basis for underwriting a business model that doesn't actually work anymore. My guess, I think a lot of journalism is gonna become reader subsidized and reader funded, but I, there'll be a lot less of it because there's just not enough of us to go around to actually pay, I think, for the large news making uh, organizations that used to exist. Um, yeah, it's, I think we're, yeah, I, I think the newspaper itself though, I think a lot of the big ones will, will slowly go under. Um, and you know, they'll either get bought up by big monopolies or they might, you know, become part of like, uh, like loss leaders for politically minded, you know, billionaires and stuff like that. Like, I, yeah, I don't even know, does the Washington Post make money? Maybe. Um, yeah, but I, like it's, I think there's a big change. I think it's undergoing and I think a lot of them will disappear or, um, or like they'll have to change, like they'll have to be reader funded. But again, there's just not enough money there to be reader funded entirely. So yeah, it's interesting. Right on. Uh, we've been here about an hour and a half now. Uh, if uh, you don't want to take too much of Dan's time, but I'll just open it up once once again. If anyone else has a has a has a question for Tom or Dan, uh, uh, and now uh, All right, not seeing any. Uh, how about we, uh, we, uh, we wrap up? Uh, I can speak for the Luxembourg Club. We have another meeting uh, later today. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so we are anxious to have a, uh, a bit of a buffer between the two, uh, nice. the educational and, uh, and, and a regular meeting.
But uh, but please don't let that stop you. Uh, if you have anything else, and you don't, so let's just say goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Dr. Dan, and uh, for, and, uh, and secondly to our uh, to our uh, to our guests here today, uh, who may not be part of the, the Communist Party, but you're always welcome uh, to these things. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks uh, thanks a bunch, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you around. Nice, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone saw in the chat, but uh, Jesse Hirsch, a, a good friend of mine, um, he left. He actually has written a lot about municipal stuff, so check that out. Um, yeah. Jesse's a great guy to talk about that. I'm Much more that. creative and thoughtful about those things than I am. Awesome. So, <laughs> awesome, thank you. And when we, uh, uh, I, I'll, I will send out uh, uh, if, once we get the, the video chopped up uh, and uh, and presentable. Uh, uh, also, uh, the links that we, we, we shared here today uh, in the chat, including Jesse's work, uh, uh, will be will be made available to the uh, to everyone who registered. Thank awesome. you. Uh, yeah. So that'll be it. Hey, right thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I uh, wish I was there with y'all, but this will have to do for now. So, yeah, and really, thanks thanks for organizing this. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, yeah. thanks for being here. It's great to see you again. And uh, yeah, please uh, uh, take care in uh, dear old lady. Uh, and <laughs> yep. uh, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it there. All right, sounds good. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Yay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.